Hello, my name is Mary Kenny, and um, I'm with Trina Rio Muto, and we're both from the National Immigration Litigation Alliance, and we are back for part two of the introduction to federal court, um, district court practice. And we're thrilled to be with you. Next slide, please. Um, this presentation is part of our partnership, a partnership between SILA and NILA. And through that partnership, we do, um, we're doing a series of trainings. We do some practice advisories. You'll see on this slide some of the upcoming trainings. So uh, please watch for announcements about them and join us. Thanks. And here's just another slide indicating that we do trainings. There, we are helping provide some resources, practice advisories, and we also provide technical assistance, and, in, and that includes legal writing um, assistance and um, sort of uh, in-depth uh, assistance with individual writing. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please get in touch with SELA, and they will uh, direct you to us, but we'd be happy to work with you on it. So today, um, in part two, we're, we're going to look at the major components of a district court action um, up until the point of trial. And since most immigration district court um, litigation does not actually go to trial, this really covers the major components of what you likely will face in a case. Um, and it includes the um, complaint and how to structure your complaint. We're going to talk about uh, the government's initial answer, whether it be an, a, um, a or responsive pleading, whether it be an answer or a motion to dismiss. We're going to talk about the source of evidence. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about motions for summary judgment and then some practical considerations. So let's start by delving in a little deeper to what is included in a federal court complaint. And the first thing I'll point out is there are, um, in any case where you should start is always the federal rules of civil procedure and your local rules. And you should always take a look at those and see uh, which, what rules are relevant to the particular um, portion of a case that you're working on. So for purposes of, a, of the complaint or the initial pleading, the relevant rules are listed here. They're pretty straightforward. I'll just flag a couple of things. Um, one is um, in rule eight, um, you should be aware that it makes clear that um, there are three, com three essential components to a complaint. One is that you need to have a statement that demonstrates that the court has jurisdiction. Two, you need to demonstrate that the um, plaintiff is entitled to relief. And three, you need to make a demand. And so those are the three itemized um, components in Rule 8. The other thing that Rule 8 is clear on is that it's fine to have alternate theories of relief, and it's fine to have theories that are inconsistent. And so really what that tells you is that if there are different ways that you could win your case, if there are different theories um, that would help you, that would lead to a favorable result, include them all. Later, you can sort out what ones are the ones you, you um, are going to pursue, or maybe you'll pursue them all, but argue them alternatively, and that's perfectly okay. Um, that, if we could go back one second. Um, in rule 11, let me just um, tell you that it, it specifies you do need to not just sign the complaint, but you need to include an address, a phone number, an email. And what you're doing um, by signing the complaint is you're indicating to the court that the claims that you are presenting in the complaint are supported by a non-frivolous ar argument. It, it doesn't need to be a slam dunk argument. It's but it can be one for an extension of the law, but it still has to be non-frivolous. And two, that the facts that you're presenting in the complaint either have some evidentiary support or they are facts that likely will have evidentiary support upon further um, 
uh, investigation and or after discovery. And with respect to facts that you don't know definitively exist, but you believe exist in a complaint, you can always um, indicate that you're alleging these facts upon information and belief, which is sort of a flag to say, we expect to be able to prove this, even if we can't prove it right at this moment. The, the final point I'll make is check your local rules because different courts have different um, rules with respect to how to, how to um, frame your complaint. For instance, I'll give you one quick example is the um, district court in DC specifies that in the caption of any opening complaint, you need to include the address of the plaintiff and the address of all the defendants or all the plaintiffs and all the defendants. That's uh, not typical of other uh, district courts, but it is very specific for, uh, you know, it's specifically articulated in the local rules for the District of Columbia. Okay, thanks. So the standard components of a complaint are, you have to have a caption, and we're gonna talk about each of these. You need to have an introduction. You need to have a statement of jurisdiction. You need to, to specify why there is venue in this particular court. And um, you, it's helpful to um, indicate in cases in which exhaustion is a requirement, you need to demonstrate that the exhaustion requirement has been met. And in cases in which it's not required, it's helpful to, to flag for the court that there is no requirement for an exhaustion for exhaustion of administrative remedies. You need to identify the parties. Um, it's helpful to have a legal background and we'll explain why. Uh, you wanna lay out the facts that support the claim. You wanna lay out the claims and then you wanna have a prayer for relief. And, and I'll just say with respect to all of that, the rules, the federal rules require that a complaint consist of numbered paragraphs and each paragraph should indicate, um, should sort of concern a single set of circumstances. Um, and so you wanna be sure to, to format your uh, complaint with the appropriate numbered paragraphs. Okay, caption and introduction. So the caption obviously is not numbered. It's just what's at the top of the complaint. It needs to include the, um, the names of the plaintiffs and the defendants. And again, look at your local rules to see uh, another court, for instance, requires the attorney name and address to be at the very top above the caption. And so you wanna figure out all those formatting rules based on the local rules. Um, but generally the components of a caption are the, the names of the parties, the, um, you want to put that label that it's a complaint and you'll want to leave room to insert a civil action number and um, anything else that the court may require you to identify. So some courts require you to identify the name of the judge, for instance. Um, that will all be included after you file um, because obviously at the point in time you're filing, you don't have a number yet. You don't have a, uh, the name of the judge. Below the um, caption, the next section is an introduction and it's not technically required. I think it's always a good idea to have one because it provides the court and his or, uh, the judge and his or her clerks with kind of a, a um, big picture quick synopsis of what this case is about. And it's good to include in the introduction um, something with respect to what the claim is, including the statutory or regulatory or um, other ground under which you're bringing the case. The, um, it's good to highlight the harm to your plaintiff. You really wanna um, humanize your plaintiff right from the get-go and any compelling facts that, um, the, that, that you want the court to be aware of right from the start, you should include in the um, complaint. And then it's, it's a good idea to let the court know what the relief is that you are seeking. Um, because again, 
that allows the court to then think about the complaint um, and the various elements as it goes through and as it reads further, as, as the um, judge or the clerk reads further. So the next required um, components of a complaint is that, and this is absolutely necessary, as I indicated, the, the federal rules make clear that you have to demonstrate that the court has jurisdiction. And the major jurisdictional provisions um, for any district court action are the federal court, the federal question uh, jurisdiction provision, which is 28 USC 1331. For any case in which you are bringing your claims under the Administrative Procedure Act, the APA, you're gonna want to allege federal question jurisdiction under 1331. Uh, the APA itself is not a jurisdictional statute. It provides a cause of action or kind of the um, vehicle by which you're getting into court, but it doesn't give the court the authority to hear the case. And that's really what jurisdiction is. Um, it provides the court with the authority to hear the case. So for APA cases, they all would involve a federal question. And so 28 USC Section 1331 is the jurisdictional provision. For mandamus, the Mandamus Act itself provides the jurisdiction. And so you can allege um, the jurisdictional basis by alleging, by specifying the Mandamus Statute 28 USC 1361. And for the Declaratory Judgment Act, again, it provides the jurisdiction and the relevant site is 28 USC sections 2201 and 2202. Um, venue, there is a specific venue provision for cases involving the US, the United States as a party or in um, it, which would be relevant in say a, a case under the Federal Tort Claims Act where you're actually suing the United States in most of these, in most of the other immigration district court cases, you're going to be suing an official or an aid or a federal agency. And, um, but the same venue provision applies to all three, and it's 28 USC 1391E. And it specifies that venue exists in one of several possibilities. One is where the plaintiff resides if there's no real property involved. Another is where the defendant resides, which would be the location of the um, of the office of the defendant because you're naming an uh, individual um, off official because you're naming him or her in um, their official capacity or the uh, office location for the agency. And then the third basis, the third major basis um, is uh, where the, a, um, a substantial part, I'm looking at, I know it's a substantial part of the events occurred. Um, and so for instance, if you're suing over a action by um, a, a USCIS um, uh, off particular office, then venue would be there both because you'd be naming the head of that office, but also because a substantial portion of the facts relate to what happened, what took place in that office, in that location. And so you might list both of those as the, um, as the basis for venue. Exhaustion, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about um, exhaustion. You do need to, to specify, as I indicated before, you need to specify if exhaustion is required. Um, for APA claims, which many of these cases are gonna involve, um, you, you definitely should take a look at Darby v. Cisneros because it made clear that exhaustion is only required in, in, in APA cases in very limited circumstances. And um, one of the primary elements that's required in order for there to be an exhaustion requirement is that there has to be either a mandatory statutory or regulatory um, requirement for exhaustion. And without that, there's, there's no, uh, it's not necessary for you to exhaust remedy. So for instance, again, I'm gonna go back to USCIS. Uh, there's no statutory or regulatory requirement 
that an individual appeal, say, a denial of an adjustment of, of um, status application to the administrative appeals office. And so there's no, for an APA claim, there's no exhaustion requirement under Darby in that type of case. Then the next section of your complaint is going to be just identifying who the parties are. And at this point in the complaint, you really want to keep it very simple and just demonstrate who the, uh, who the party is and the basis for their being named as a party. So for instance, um, if you have an individual whose application was denied, you can state their name, you can state their residence, um, and then not the specific address, but that they reside in the di within this district, for instance, or the town and the, and the state, and then state that they had an application denied by USCIS. And then for the defendants, you wanna make clear that you're suing individuals in their official capacity, and you wanna make clear what their role is that leads them to be the appropriate person to be named as um, a defendant in the case. So what is their responsibility that is relevant for purposes of the claim in your case? And then finally, um, for agencies, you wanna do the same thing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Trina now. Thanks, Mary, and hi, everyone. It's nice to be here with you back again for part two of this webinar. Um, I'm gonna be talking about sort of the remaining three structural requirements of a um, district court claim uh, complaint. Um, and this first one that I'm talking about is not necessarily required, but like the introduction that Mary was talking about, it is really helpful um, and advisable to include a legal background. Um, I think a lot of immigration attorneys are practicing in immigration court where we throw around acronyms like INA and LPR and AOS. Um, and that's just the lingo that we live in. But federal district courts are not familiar with that lingo and even less familiar um, are the clerks. And you have to sort of remember that the judges clerks are recent graduates from law school. They may or may not have taken an immigration class. They may have some degree of familiarity, but some this may be the first immigration case that they ever saw. So you really need to take this as an opportunity to educate the judge and the clerks who don't assume that they don't understand anything about immigration law. They don't understand anything about your case or what happened. And you're gonna get into the facts of what happened, but before you do, you wanna sort of set the stage. Like, what is this application about? Um, what, are, what are the legal issues that are gonna come up? Because you wanna kind of preface, preface them in your legal background and give the reader a framework in order to understand your factual background about what you're complaining about and what your claims are, like what are the violations? And you sort of need to do this in this legal background section. And I would say most complaints um, um, are uh, uh, very scant, they have very scant legal citations, but legal background section is where you kind of include citations. If your complaint is about a regulatory violation or you have a problem with a precedent decision, or um, there's a statutory violation, this is where you are going to, um, you may have introduced a little bit of that into, in the introduction, but this is where you're gonna hone in on it. And um, you'll see here that there's a bullet that says, um, include only information that's necessary to the issue in the case. And I can't emphasize that enough. Sometimes immigration, procedural histories are long and complicated. And there's a lot of things that got your client to the point where they are now. Um, maybe you have, they had an asylum application. Maybe they had a long trek to uh, the United States and there's things that happened in their home country that make them particularly sympathetic. That's fine, right? But your um, complaint 
might just be complaining about the USCIS application, an EAD issue, or a U visa issue, or SIJS issue, or an I-130, whatever the case may be. You don't need to go into the legal background about all of that other stuff. You really want to focus on the legal background that's at issue in your complaint. Um, and so really with very basic, a basic start, oftentimes, you know, we're, we're talking about introducing the statute. You start with the INA, right? This is the statutory right that's provided. And then maybe you move to the regulations and the regulations implement this statutory right and you talk about how they do it. Um, I mean, because you don't want to assume that the court understands this and you also don't want to make the court go read the statute and the regulations you want to direct them right to where where they're going to need to be for purposes of understanding your complaint and understanding the complaints, uh, the claims in your complaint. Um, you know, while um, we all have a tendency to um, reference those acronyms, I would caution you to avoid it as much as possible with the one exception that if like there's a term that you are bringing up constantly um, and it's long, maybe you shorten that. I mean, I think LPR is one that folks commonly shorten, but you don't want to use acronyms throughout the complaint because your reader is going to have to go back and remember what those acronyms are every time. Um, and so avoid shorthand references, explain immigration terms, and spell out those acronyms for the very first time. Um, and really just focus on what your case is about in the legal background section. Next slide. So now we're moving on to the factual section, which is really important. Um, you have to include the facts of, about your client and about his or her procedural history. Um, you know, Mary mentioned before, you humanize the client, use his or her name, um, don't use plaintiff, and don't use the government if you're talking about one entity within the government, spell, you know, reference that entity. Are we talking about DHS? Are we talking about ICE? That's fine, but you want to like bring this into a story, into a narrative, and you do that by using people's names. Um, I think it's okay to include facts that make your client look sympathetic. Um, as you see on your slide here, there's an example. Mrs. Z is the mother of and sole provider for three U.S. citizen children under the age of 15. Now, maybe Miss Z's complaint doesn't have anything to do with her kids, but by pointing out the fact that she's a mother and she's the sole provider, you've just um, portrayed her as, as rather human and rather sympathetic. Um, in employment-based cases, you know, Mr. X has worked for the same employer, X supermarket, for so many years, and then he's worked his way up. It doesn't even have to be an employment-based case. I'm just saying employment comes up often in those types of complaints. But if your client had a job with the same employer, then you, you might mention that or, you know, multiple. That's, that shows that that person is, um, you know, out making a living. Um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully lawfully. You might not want to mention it if the person <laughs> it doesn't have work authorization or is not allowed to work uh, legally. Um, and, and I think I want to reemphasize also to Mary's point, um, I think that in the factual section, you are giving everything that you know to be facts. But sometimes there's stuff that you sort of know to be facts, but you don't have documentary evidence of it. And so then you include the language on information and belief, right? That is your way of saying, you know, this is what we believe to be true. I have a friend who, when he drafts district court complaints, um, you know, they're very succinct and they're numbered paragraphs. And each paragraph may have one or, or two or three sentences in it. But after, before he files, he goes back and he looks at the complaint and says, do I have, what is my proof of this fact? Do I have a document that supports this fact? 
Um, you don't have to include citations in the facts section because everything in the facts section is bacon, basically taken to be true by the court because you are alleging it. It is factual allegation. So you don't need to say, see document da, 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 that shows what I'm trying to say here. But, but as a good practice, you do need to make sure that everything you're saying is true and accurate. You can't play loosey goose with the facts because that will come back to bite you in district court litigation. And so it's a good practice to just go through and check to make sure that you um, have support for everything you're saying. And then when you get to the procedural history part of the facts, um, as you're weaving it in, you kind of want to talk about what you're challenging in a way that will set up your claims nicely. So when you're talking about that USCIS decision, you know, in your facts, you're going to say on such and such a date, so-and-so applied, and maybe there's gonna be some additional uh, information after that about whatever they applied for. Maybe USCIS issued an RFE on such and such a date asking for more evidence about blah, blah, blah. Um, but then you're getting to the part of, of what the USCIS decision is that you're challenging. And so there you might want to say, um, USCIS denied the application on such and such a date and so denying it, you know, USCIS stated, right? You don't wanna say erroneously stated because that's what you're there to prove. You wanna stay factual and you wanna say what the basis of the decision were. Um, I think it's a thing that uh, people tend to do where they wanna add their opinions about the facts, but you don't do that in a district court complaint. You just say, this is what happened. Um, and if in fact, they decided it without considering evidence or addressing evidence that might be part of your claim, that is a fact that you can say. Its decision, in its decision, USCIS did not address X, Y, and Z. Or in its decision, um, USCIS stated X fact. And if X fact is wrong, you wanna make sure that earlier in your recitation of the facts, you've stated it correctly. Right. So you want to be able to show that, you know, the facts, you know, said one thing and USCIS's decision said something different. Um, so that's I think that's all I'm going to say about facts and we can, can move on to. Can I, can I step yeah. in for one second? Yeah. Because um, Trina, could you talk a little bit about exhibits attached to a complaint? Because that's yeah. a big issue and I know in the, yeah. a lot of people right. tend to, to attach lots of exhibits. Right, and actually that goes back, Mary, to your point about um, looking at those local rules because some district courts will not allow you to attach exhibits to a district court complaint. And you wanna make sure that you are not offending that rule by attaching anything. Um, other courts will let you attach, uh, you know, it's not for forbidden. But as I said, the factual allegations are taken as true. So you don't need to attach all of those documents that support the fact. I think generally, if you're, if you're challenging USCIS decision, you might attach that decision. Or if um, you have, yeah, I think that's if it's a FOIA case, and I know this is you know, a little different from FOIA, you might attach the FOIA request that they didn't respond to. Um, in district court litigation with respect to damages or if there's an exhaustion requirement, you might attach the document that proves that you exhausted. But in general, it is not like filing a BIA appeal um, brief where you have to have tabs and or you put tabs and IJ briefs and you put all the documentation in there. What's quite nice about district court is what you say is taken to be true which is why it's really, really important to ensure the accuracy of those facts and the allegations. Okay, so let's move on to the um, claim and prayer for relief. So there's one section about the claims and there's another section about the prayer for relief. So there's no set number of claims that you have to have in a complaint. You can have a complaint with one claim. You can have a complaint with 10 or more 
claims. Um, those are harder cases to, to litigate. <laughs> um, but generally, when you get to the claims section, you have, you know, a section that it can be called different things. It can be called causes of action. And then you have count one, like we have here on the slide. Um, it could say claims for relief. And, you know, um, but generally they're, they're numbered um, either with um, one, two, three, four, five, or you could have that numbered in Roman numerals. There's just, uh, you want it, the court to be able to reference the counts. Um, my personal preference is that each type of claim get its own count. So if count one is under the Administrative Procedure Act, I generally tend to put count two under the Mandamus Act if I'm, I'm doing a complaint like that, um, just so it's clean, but but there's no set way. Some people put you know violation of the Administrative Procedure Act and Mandamus statute where they clump them all in and they talk about one thing. I personally think it's cleaner um, to separate them out, um, but that's just me. And the more that you do of these uh, cases, the more you'll have your own preference as you go along. The most important thing about the counts and the causes of action is that um, your very first, <laughs> uh, the very first uh, paragraph under account says you, that you're incorporating by reference everything alleged above, right? Everything in, in paragraphs one through whatever that you know paragraph number is, um, is alleged and incorporated into the count. And that's just your way of saying, hey, everything that I've just talked about is, is relevant to this cause of action. Um, and you just sort of want to say the basic elements of the claim um, that what's required under the um, section of law that you're alleging has been violated and how the facts of your case meet that each element of that claim. So, for example, if you are doing an APA action and you're arguing that USCIS's decision was um, arbitrary and capricious uh, and contrary to law, you want to sort of set out the, that the Administrative Procedures Act, you know, and the subsection which allows for claims uh, against agencies where their actions is arbitrary, capricious, and contrary to law. And then you want to say, and USCIS's decision in this case is arbitrary and capricious because and it's contrary to law because, and you wanna really lay that out so the court can understand, ah, here's the statutory section that they say is being violated and here's how they're seeing it's being violated. That's really important. And just, um, you know, uh, you can have somebody who's not a lawyer read your complaint and see if they can understand what you're trying to say. And that is a good test um, to ask them, hey, do you understand what, what I'm saying in this section? Um, because you really want it to be understandable. Um, with respect to the prayer for relief section, that always comes at the end. Um, and it includes sort of numbered paragraphs or subnumbered or letter paragraphs setting out the what you're what you're asking for. So are you asking for declaratory relief, you know, declaring XYZ? Are you asking for any kind of injunctive relief? Um, and you know, we always include a catch-all that says we're asking for this, this, and this and any other relief that the court deems just and appropriate in this matter. And you, that's really, really important. You always want to include that catch-all phrase, any other relief um, that the court deems just and appropriate, because things may come up in the course of your case, and you may want to argue to the court that the judge should do something that wasn't specifically specified in your complaint, because it's just inappropriate. And then last but not least, you're gonna to wanna to include a uh, provision that the court should award attorney's fees. Um, and some people leave it you know, like that, other people specify under EJA, or if it's a FOIA case, you'll specify the FOIA statute or whatever the case may be. I mean, best practice is to include that claim for attorney's fees 
under whatever provision you think is appropriate, but then give yourself an out that says, or any other applicable provision of law, right? So um, you want to build into your pleading in these complaints best practices, which give you, you know, in case you make a mistake, you've pled also that you should get attorney's fees under any applicable provision of law. Next slide. I'll turn it back to Mary. So um, now we're going to turn to um, the government's opening um, document and responsive document. And that would be either an answer or a motion to dismiss. And we'll talk about both of those. Um, first, we'll look at if you can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the relevant rules. Um, and again, these are very straightforward. I'm not going to go through them. You should take a look at each of them. Um, rule 8C, the one thing I will note is Rule 8C sets out affirmative defenses, but you should read that in conjunction with Rule 12B because Rule 12B includes other affirmative defenses, including um, jurisdiction and lack of venue, improper venue, um, that can be pled through a motion to dismiss. Um, and don't, so it doesn't necessarily have to be raised in an answer. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk for a minute about the government's answer. Um, with respect to any responsive pleading, the government has 60 days after service on the AUSA or the assistant US attorney um, to file the answer or the motion to dismiss. And it can, the, um, if it files a motion to dismiss, that's in lieu of an answer. And um, as long as it does it within the, the 30, the 60 days, um, that's acceptable. Um, if the defendants in the case choose to file an answer, that answer has to respond to each and every numbered paragraph in the complaint. And that answer has to either, the, the choices are that it either admits it or it denies it. It um, says that the defendants say that they are without sufficient knowledge. So sometimes, for instance, where you've laid out some facts relating to your client to sort of humanize the client, that, that might be an instance where the government would say it just doesn't have sufficient knowledge to either admit or deny it. Um, or where you've raised legal conclusions um, uh, or legal statement, statements of the law, it, the answer can say that no response is required for that legal statement or legal conclusion. Um, but those are really the four choices and every paragraph needs to be responded to in the answer. And then in addition, either before that or after it, I've seen, I've seen um, it done both ways, the defendants can set out their affirmative defenses. And that can include the types of defenses included in the Rule 8, um, 8C, or it can include lack of jurisdiction, um, improper venue, things like that. Um, and, it, and it can raise those in an answer with the idea that maybe subsequently it, it will move to dismiss. It doesn't, the, the defendants don't have to necessarily move to dismiss immediately, particularly with respect to jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, uh, a lack of jurisdiction, a defendant can raise at any time um, in the proceeding. So it's not limited to only raising it in its initial responsive document. Next. Okay, we're back to Trina. Thanks, Mary. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the most common um, defenses and actions that we see in immigration litigation. And no one, if they're doing district court action should be surprised if they see a motion to dismiss. It's very common and it doesn't mean that your complaint wasn't good. Um, it just means that the government is pulling out their first line of defense. Um, and so you should expect it. And um, we'll talk about what that briefing looks like and what happens afterwards. 
But the very first point here is that it's very common. And you have here on your slide the most common basis that the government will assert. Um, and those are under the federal rules. You have 12B1, which is a lack of jurisdiction. And that can include things like provisions of the INA, which are usually in 8 USC 1252 or INA section 242. Um, there's a bunch of provisions that limit federal court jurisdiction and the government will um, refer to those provisions and argue that they apply to dismiss the complaint. There's mootness, which comes up when the government has taken corrective action, um, either um, usually after you filed your complaint and the government will argue that there's no longer a live case or controversy for the federal court to decide. Um, and finally, there's lack of standing, which means that your plaintiff is not in a position that doesn't have the, um, is it, doesn't fall within the zone of interests of the statute to um, assert the claims that he or she is asserting. Now, all of these arguments have counter arguments. And because it's so common, if you are to get one of these motions to dismiss, making any of these arguments, you can be sure that your colleagues have also <laughs> seen something. I mean, maybe if it's a novel question, um, it's, a, it's a sort of, uh, you know, you might have to look hard, but one thing that you should do is you, should, you shouldn't in any district court litigation feel like you are the only person researching and arguing these arguments. It's really important in federal court litigation to reach out because everybody wants you to succeed because if the government succeeds in dismissing your complaint, they will use that decision, you know, as a citation in other cases, um, why, you know, a similar case should be dismissed. And so don't be uh, uh, rattled when you get a lack of dismiss, motion to dismiss, just reach out and there are going to be people who are willing, you know, we at Nyla are willing to help folks um, prepare a response to that, an opposition to that motion to dismiss. The other type of motion to dismiss that's really common is the failure to state a claim for which relief may be granted. Um, that's a Rule 12b6 motion, and it basically alleges that you haven't met one of the elements of the claim that's required. Um, and they may seek to just dismiss based on the allegation of either the legal deficiency in the case or the factual deficiency. And so um, those are often quite common and the, and the government often interprets those rule 12b6 motions quite broadly. And so it's really often in the opposition just a matter of saying, no, hey, we have alleged the correct um, factual and legal elements and here's why and here's the relief that the court can grant. Finally, there's um, rule 12b3, which governs a lack of improper venue. Um, I think this of the three is probably the one that uh, is least common, but that's not to say that it doesn't come up and it's not to say that there aren't people out there with briefing that can help you. So you should definitely reach out um, because when you get one of these, um, what you'll have to do is you'll have to oppose it. And so let's move to the next slide. The thing about motion practice in district court is that it's generally limited to the three briefs. It's the government's motion to, um, to dismiss your case. It's your opposition and the government will then have an opportunity to file a reply. Um, Sometimes, and this is really important to check local rules, you'll be able to file a SIR reply, but usually the ability to file a SIR reply is contingent upon getting permission from the district court to file that. Um, so don't just read their reply and get outraged and file something. At that point, you really need to check the local rules and the judge's standing orders because they they sometimes allow them and they sometimes have strong feelings that they're not allowed and you don't wanna do something to um, irritate your judge. Um, the timing, the length, the format, 
All of that is governed by the local rules. It's, it's usually can be found in rule seven. Um, judges see a lot of motions. And so it's not uncommon to see standing orders from the judge that have specific requirements about motion practice in their court. Um, so you definitely want to be familiar with that. On a motion to dismiss, the court could hear argument on that um, motion, which takes the form of a hearing. Um, and th there's uh, the court will have a calendar and uh, the party filing the motion sometimes has to notice the hearing date on the calendar. Um, and so you would then have to prepare for a motion hearing on a motion to dismiss and you basically have to be ready to answer the, the judge's questions. Um, if the court is to deny that motion to dismiss, it's like, yay, that's great. Um, that just means that the government then has time to answer. But it is really great if the court denies it, right? There's, there's a couple options here, right? The court's gonna deny it and your case is gonna move along or the court's gonna grant it and your case is over and that's the time to consider an appeal or the court could grant part of it and deny part of it. Um, so these are all options that could come from uh, you know, motion to dismiss briefing. And when I say they can grant part or deny part, usually what happens is they'll dismiss certain counts, but keep other counts. And so um, the case will proceed on the case on the counts that have not been dismissed. Some judges, if there is a defect in the pleading, will give the plaintiff an opportunity to amend the complaint. And so they'll say things in the opinion that says, I'm gonna deny this, but with leave to amend the complaint, you know, um, the court, you know, that gives you an opportunity to file an amended complaint. And it's a good signal when the court does that. It means that the court thinks that there's something to your case, but there's some deficiency that's keeping the judge from ruling on your claim. And so, you know, in that situation, it's generally advisable to amend. But the, the and, and for a lot of the folks are doing immigration litigation, um, and I know for Mary and I, if you get past the motion to dismiss stage, that is really an opportunity. It is an opportunity to approach government counsel and say, hey, we've just sur survived this motion to dismiss. The court is, you know, seems inclined on these issues. Um, hopefully the opinion will have said some good things that are helpful to your case. And you wanna reach out and say, hey, is the government willing to settle at this point, right? Before we continue this protracted litigation, the court has already signaled that there's meritorious, there's claims that need to be heard here. Um, and so I would encourage each of you to sort of reach out after, if you're successful in a motion to dismiss um, and see if the government's willing to change their position because you have a lot of leverage at, at that point. And I think we'll just move on. Great. So I am going to talk now. You've survived a huge sigh of relief. You've survived uh, dismissal. And so now you really want to start thinking about, I mean, you know, you'll, you'll have been thinking about this all along, but you really want to put a lot more energy into thinking about your evidentiary record because you're going to need that record um, to move for summary judgment and um, to oppose any motion for summary judgment that the government may raise and in those few cases that end up going to trial for, um, for preparing for trial. Um, but the majority of them don't go to trial, so we're really gonna focus on, on the administrative record um, or discovery and the evidentiary record you'd need for summary judgment. Um, and there are two types, uh, sort of two paths to developing a record in this case. Um, one is in APA cases and the other is in for, with respect to non-APA cases. Um, the, uh, under the APA, the, um, the statute itself indicates that the case is to be decided on the administrative record that has, uh, that has been prepared by the agency. And it's the agency's responsibility to prepare and file the administrative record. 
but before the agency actually files that record, it um, the the assistant U.S. attorney, or if the Office of Immigration Litigation is involved, the oil attorney, um, will reach out to you and provide you with a copy of what they propose to be in the administrative record. And that's your opportunity to look at it and to think about, is there anything missing from this record that they are proposing? The, the administrative record, um, there's a fair amount of case law which indicates that the, the administrative record has to include all materials that directly or indirectly were considered by the agency decision maker, including evidence that's contrary to the decision. And so you wanna think about, are there memos out there um, that pertain to the issue that are contrary to the agency decision? Is there something out there that you know would have been before the adjudicator that the adjudicator may not have relied on, um, but that it, that he or she could have relied on that would have influenced the decision and that would be helpful to proving your case. Um, and, and you also wanna go through and, and make sure that everything in, the, in your client's file that you believe is necessary to prove your case has been included in the administrative record. And if you find that there are things that are missing, you that's your opportunity to negotiate with the uh, opposing counsel to get those documents included because it's really important that you have a record that's going to that is going to support all of the arguments that you will make um, to demonstrate your clients that your client should win the case. Um, there are very very limited situations in which a court will permit uh, um, information outside of the record in APA cases. And I'm not gonna get into all of the examples, but if you believe that there is something that absolutely should be included and you're not um, able to convince the AUSA or the oil attorney to include it, um, you should do some research, figure out in your circuit what those, uh, what situation, because it varies a little bit from, from circuit to circuit. So um, the, Court of Appeals uh, cases within your circuit, take a look at them, see what the court has said in terms of what those situations are. And um, that's a situation in which you can always call us or call others to brainstorm about whether or not there may be an argument to get the, the, um, the particular exhibit or document into the record. But your first line of um, offense should always be to try to work with a government attorney to convince them that this should be included in the record. And again, in doing that, you, you wanna have the case law, your circuit court law behind you to demonstrate, yes, this standard is not simply what the agency, agency thinks should be in the record. It's a standard that says what was directly or indirectly considered by the agency decision makers. And, and that language varies a little bit from circuit to circuit. So you want to get exactly what your court of appeals has said um, to support your arguments for um, expanding the record beyond what um, the government is proposing. So then um, for non-APA cases, where does the evidence come from? And that um, in generally that means that in those cases the um, the option of discovery is available. Um, discovery is limited in the APA cases, but in all other cases for all other claims for relief, the general rules of discovery, which are found in the federal rules of civil procedure at rules twenty six through thirty seven, apply. And so you're going to want to look at those rules. Um, and uh, essentially there are four major forms of discovery. There's three written forms and those are interrogatories, which are written questions to the opposing party um, to ask for a written response to the specific question. There are requests for admissions where um, 
you as counsel for your client state a proposition, either factual um, or sometimes a legal conclusion based on the facts and ask the government, the opposing party, um, the official or the agency or whoever it is to admit that fact. Um, and then there are requests for production of documents where you ask for um, any and all records that may pertain to specific issues and you identify those issues um, with some specificity. Um, those are the written forms of discovery that are available. In addition, there um, are depositions that can be taken. And obviously those are, are instances where you will sit down with a particular witness on the other side, whether it's a witness that the government has identified as the person with most knowledge of the particular issue. That would be a witness that's been identified under Rule 30B6 of the federal rules, um, or whether it's somebody that you've named because you think they have relevant information. Um, you may have gotten their name through the, in, the responses to the interrogatories or from your review of documents that were produced um, in your request for, for production of records. Um, and in the deposition, that's where you have the opportunity to question those people and they're, um, they have to testify under oath um, with a court reporter there. Um, there is an initial exchange of information that's required under the rules. Um, and um, you're going to have to you, you take a look at that and exchange that information. That includes information related to um, sort of the names of anybody that may have relevant knowledge. Um, and I should have looked at that role before I uh, before this presentation, but you can look. It, it's got a number of very specific items that are required as the initial disclosures that you share with the government and both sides have to share that information. So you have a responsibility to disclose, for instance, the names of, of the relevant witnesses and the government has the obligation to share with you the, the exact same information from their side. Um, and, and that helps then frame what's needed um, for discovery beyond that. Sort of it, it gives you the sense of some initial information to to use to think about preparing further discovery. Um, the, there's the court early on in this process before much of this gets underway, the court will have held a scheduling conference. And as a result of that scheduling conference, the court will um, issue a scheduling order and it will set forth the um, specific timelines and deadlines that the parties have to adhere to with respect to, to all discovery. Um, there may be, so you have to look uh, both at the federal rule and again, we can't emphasize enough, look at your local rules and, and look at, they're both, in many cases, they're both local rules and then the court also has, uh, the judge may have his or her own rules. Look at both sets of rules because there may be something that pertains to this. Um, and, you know, the parties can then agree to change those deadlines and move the court for extensions of, of deadlines. Um, and that's gonna be up to the discretion of the, of the court with respect to whether or not it will grant um, those motions. But they usually do. And so yeah. if it don't hesitate to move to extend deadlines, you, you wanna be careful and accurate and not feel like you're rushed with everything else that you have going on. So as long as it doesn't prejudice your client, push stuff off until you can get a great product. Um, we're getting close to the end of the presentation, so I'm going to just briefly touch on motions for summary judgment. And if you've gotten to the stage of summary judgment, that's great because you may have survived a motion to dismiss. You may have, you know, dealt with the answer. Maybe, um, maybe you've done some discovery. Mostly not in immigration cases, um, but uh, you're at a point. And the thing about motion for summary judgment briefing. It usually means that you're going to get a merits ruling from a federal district court judge on your case, um, and so that's great. So let's let's move on to uh, the applicable rule. The next slide. Summary judgment motions um, are 
come up, I mean, the, it's rule 56 and it requires that there's no genuine dispute as to a material fact and the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So motions for summary judgment as the rule implies indicates that you're going to get a district court judge ruling on the law um, because the facts are not disputed. And um, the government can move for summary judgment as can you. Both parties can move for summary judgment. We call that cross uh, motions for summary judgment. And um, I guess the one advice that relates back to what Mary was talking about on the scheduling orders is you really want to work with your opposing counsel to try to work out a briefing schedule that works for both of you and everything else that you have going on. Um, uh, motion briefing is generally uh, three briefs, right? So if you're moving and the government's moving, you know, that's six sets of briefs you might want to talk to the government about simultaneous motions or a motion that's filed and then you know their opposition is also their motion so you can work it out so there's four sets of briefs there's a lot of stuff that you can do um the basics of the brief uh in support of a motion for summary judgment are as you can see what you would expect i mean in generally legal pleadings, you have an intro, you have your legal background, which sure you laid out in your complaint, but now you're laying it out in a brief because you want to remind the court what the legal issue is. Um, your facts are the uncontributed facts. And in this section, you are citing to that administrative record. You are letting the court know where the facts can be found in the district court record. That's different from the facts I was talking about in the complaint, which are allegations, and they're taken as true at that stage. But when you're in summary judgment briefing, you need to cite to the record when you're talking about your facts. Um, you have your argument section and your conclusion. You're also, again, like a broken record, checking those local rules and those standing orders. Some courts, like I think one of the district courts in New York requires for all summary judgment briefs, like a separate pleading, that is the statement of undisputed facts. Um, <coughs> and um, other courts allow it to be part of the summary judgment briefing. You just have to check. Um, most district court judges, if they have standing orders, will have a section about summary judgment motions. So you wanna look at that. Um, see how they want it done. All of the rules about timing and format and length are set forth in the uh, federal rules of civil procedure or the local rules. But again, also check those standing orders. And just like a motion to dismiss, the court can hold a hearing on the motion for summary judgment where you will be mostly arguing the law, right? The facts are supposedly undisputed. So it's all about applying those, those facts to the law. So just say that about motions for summary judgment. Um, last slide here is uh, strategies for dealing with counsel. There's two types of counsel that you should be dealing with in district court. One is your co-counsel. And I cannot underscore how important it is to litigate as part of a team where you're in district court. As we've said numerous times, there's a lot of rules. You don't wanna be the only one reading those rules and checking the rules. I can't tell you how many times I've called Mary in a district court case and said, this is what I think this rule means. Are you reading it the same way? Should we call the clerk and double check? Um, it takes, a mini group of, of people to litigate these cases. And if you are fil fil uh, filing solo, you need to have a support network. Like we mentor a lot of attorneys that are doing this kind of work who call us to say, hey, did I do service correctly? Are you reading this rule this way? And, and that's what we do if they're doing solo. But I, you know, it's really important to do it um, as part of a team. It's, it's just a better product, more eyes on a product um, is always better. If you're doing a co-counseling with somebody who's not in your office, like a different firm or organization, super important. 
you want to have a co-counsel agreement. You don't want to say this person was my friend for 20 years or I've known them for five years. They're great. They're a great attorney. That's all good and well, but you need to memorialize something in writing so you know who is doing what and what is expected. So if something goes wrong, right, or, or hopefully it doesn't go wrong, but as things move forward in the case, you need to know, <laughs> oh yeah, the co-counsel agreement says that this person's gonna have all the communications with the client and I'm responsible for making sure we're complying with the local rules. Or the co-counsel agreement says, this is how we're going to keep time. This is how we're going to distribute attorney's fees. I think the number one point of contention comes up when people do a case, one person feels like they did all the work and another person didn't, they kept track of their time. And how are they gonna apportion the attorney's fees? Put that in writing. There's no, um, there's nothing wrong with having an agreement in writing between lawyers before you get into federal court and before you need that agreement. You might not refer to it, but it's there as a safety. Um, really important in federal court, as in all immigration proceedings, stay in contact with your client um, and send your client copies of communications, particularly if you're billing your client, you're spending all these hours, send them a copy of the product, the summary judgment motion, motion to dismiss, let them know what's happening. Um, in federal court, uh, if it ever got to discovery, your client would have to appear. Make sure you have a good retainer agreement where all of that is laid out with your client um, and he or she understands what you're doing for them and what's expected of them in the case. Um, and, I, and, and also timekeeping, um, unlike in immigration court and before the BIA, like this is an opportunity for the government to pay attorney's fees if you're successful, but they can only be paid if your timekeeping is accurate, if it's contemporaneous, and um, you, you don't, uh, because it has to be contemporaneous, you don't want to go back and create records to set up a timekeeping structure and make sure your co-counsel is on board with that, that they're keeping time uh, as well. So the other uh, I mean, and there's a lack that should be said about that, but um, I just want to encourage again, everyone to try to have co-counsel. It's really important. That's partly why we started NILA to have a co-counseling program um, to help people who are new to federal court practice have someone to do it with uh, for the first time or the second time so that when they go on to do it on their own, um, they know what to expect. And the other thing about district court litigation is your opposing counsel is going to be very different than your um, OPLA attorney, your ICE counsel, the attorney that you've been dealing with um, in removal proceedings. Um, you should expect them to be either an assistant U.S. attorney working for the local attorney's office or a Department of Justice attorney working in the civil division for the Office of Immigration Litigation. And uh, just a quick note about the assistant U.S. attorneys. They are not immigration experts. They may have some immigration cases on their docket, but they are probably also doing criminal cases and um, drug cases and um, contract cases and all types of cases, right? You are just one type of case in a docket of theirs from every stretch of law, right? So. Don't expect when you're talking to that U.S. attorney to be able to throw out that those acronyms. You have to sort of explain in a professional way what your case is about and lower your expectations because it's very helpful to you to educate that U.S. attorney about what you're actually asking for or you're asking him or her to do. Um, and just keep in mind that they've got a lot of other cases uh, besides yours. And so, um, yeah, just, just change how you're talking to that person. They're not going to understand your acronyms. Um, it's a little different if you happen to have the Department of Justice Office of Immigration Litigation Attorney. That's an attorney who specializes in immigration, and they're going to understand a little bit more of your acronyms. But, you know, they also do a lot of immigration litigation. They might not be experts in exactly the type of case that you have. Um, so, so just remember that. But at the same time, they'll always be courteous. It's really important that you build a good relationship with that person. Um, I shouldn't say they'll always be courteous. 99% <laughs> of the time, they are respectful and professional. And um, 
are, are going to be civil to you, you should be civil to them. They are just representing their client. Um, and, you know, it's it, in most of these cases, not, they're not looking for protracted litigation either. So think about it. If they're asking you for an extension and you can give them an extension and your client's not detained, it's not going to prejudice your client like give them that professional courtesy because you may need it back from them at another time. And remember, that is the person you are going to be approaching if you survive a motion to dismiss or you, you, know, you have something to work out with settlement, that is your contact. And so you wanna have a good relationship with them. Um, last but not least, settlement communications are governed by rule 408 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And there's inf um, information in there about how conversations and communications cannot be um, brought to the attention of the district court. There's certain confidentiality provisions that are attached to settlement communications. And so I encourage you all to look at that and um, be mindful of it because you wouldn't want to inadvertently violate the confidentiality provision of those settlement communications. And with that, I think that concludes part two of the federal court introduction to district court program.